Okay, so thanks everybody for uh, joining us this week um, for the Magnet Seminar. Uh, today, I'm very pleased to say, or just a sorry, reminder actually, that our seminars are 20 to 25 minutes. Uh, kindly ask that you uh, keep your microphones muted um, and not to interrupt the speaker. If you are having problems with your uh, internet connection, please uh, turn off your video that can help speed things up. Um, at the end of the presentation, we'll have uh, a chance for a 10 to 15 minute uh, question and discussion session. Um, you can, we'll invite you to unmute your microphone to ask your questions, but you're uh, welcome to type them into the chat and um, one of myself or the other conveners will uh, read them out for you. Uh, and at the end of the seminars, um, we have a chance for uh, an informal catch up and a bit of a, a, a chin wag with everybody. Um, and that part of the seminar is, is, is um, not recorded. Uh, so today, uh, I'm really pleased to see we've got Wynne Williams from um, the University of Edinburgh, and he will be talking to us about um, paleomagnetic recording and whether or not, oh, I apologise, I've got the wrong title on the slide there, Wynne. <laughs> I think I'm <laughs> worried then, I thought, what, what do I know about that? Well, that's what happens when I don't copy paste properly. Um, so he'll be talking today about uh, micromagnetic models and what they can tell us about uh, paleomagnetic recording. I'll pass over to you and the proper title then. Right. Okay, let's hope I keep to time. Let me just get my laser pointer working. Uh, laser pointer. Ooh. Okay. All right, so uh, let's start. So um, this talk is going to describe a new model of thermomagnetic remnants in pseudo-single domain grains using numerical micromagnetic models. And it's been a, a long time in development, working with a whole bunch of people you can see listed here, uh, particularly with uh, Les Nagy, who has, I've been working with uh, on this problem almost on a daily basis. And Lisa Talks, who has been pushing us for a long time to put our models to good use. So the talk is gonna be divided into four sections. Uh, the first three sections being very quick, if I can, make it so to get everything finished in time. Um, briefly, I'm gonna start off by saying why we need numerical models, then go on to mention a few attempts of model verification. I've cut that section down to the bare minimum. Uh, so, uh, but at the end, if you have any questions, I've got a whole bunch of data plots, forks, and other hysteresis data if you want to look at it. I will review our methodology of calculating thermal stability and blocking temperatures in pseudo single domain grains before developing that into a full TRM model and simulating multi step teleopinion intensity experiments in a sample containing single vortex domain states. So, this is where we're going to start. Uh, it's an important reminder that rocks are not simple structures in terms of magnetic recording. When, uh, the, when many of the magnetic recording models were first put forward in the 1950s by Nayel, Stone and Wolfarth and others, they produced a highly successful and for the most part accurate theory that has been verified countless times. But in reality, of course, their theories actually apply more to structures like this. These are non-interacting, uniformly magnetized, very magnetic particles. And this particular image was, take, uh, was uh, from a sample made by David Crasser using electron beam lithography some time ago. But I think it's pretty clear that these samples to which single domain theory applies do not look like rocks. Rocks look like this. So if we can get this other one going, oh, rotate, it's not gonna rotate. There we go. Uh, rocks are much more complex with irregular structures, wide variety of grain sizes and mineralogies. So these are two remarkable images uh, reconstructed by the FIB slice and view technique to reveal distributions of iron oxides inside. The one on the right is from the work of uh, Evan Nicholson. And on the left is some work I'm doing with Alison Cowan and Adrian Muxworthy at Imperial College. I think what is clear, and I think what is generally true is that we do not have arrays of non-interacting, non-uniformly magnetized grains. And in fact, if you take a, a closer look at some of Alison's data, which I have uh, access to that she's given to me the last few days, we can identify numerous grains of a highly irregular morphology. And these grain shapes and sizes have a profound impact 
on their magnetic recording characteristics, as we will see shortly. So of course, the way to understand these complex particle morphologies and the complex magnetic structures they contain are through micromagnetic modeling. And uh, here's my plug for our open source micromagnetic so uh, modeling software. This was started by Phil Ridley and myself many, many years ago, but significantly upgraded by Carl Fabian, Paddy O'Connor, Les Nagy and others. It's a robust and efficient piece of code that runs on anything from a Cray to, to an old shoebox. And those of you who might be interested in playing around with this can download it from rockbag.org where there are also some tutorials. Um, so the, I'm not gonna show you how these um, models work in detail, except to say that it's a finite element model so we start out by creating a 3D model that's filled with tetrahedral elements, such as we show here. We represent the magnetization by a unit vector at every node of each element, and then we solve for the lowest energy magnetic structures for that grain. So here are some local energy minimum solutions. Uh, here we've colored the magnetization according to, uh, in this case, according to the uh, alignment with the crystalline easy axis. And we also often highlight the vorticity by plotting the helicity isosurface. Um, as you can see that generally the more complex the shape, the more complex is its magnetic structure. We've gone to great lengths to try and verify our models and I'll show you just a couple of examples. This is a grain of magnetite along with this off axis electron holographic image on the right hand side. Uh, in some work I did with uh, Trevor Almeida some years ago. And on the left-hand side is our reconstruction of the grain and the simulated off-axis electron holographic image. And I think that shows a remarkable resemblance to that of the real grain. Uh, some other work uh, that I've done here is uh, with Evenya Kakova from the RM in Minnesota who produced these amazing magnetic force microscope images of a large TM54 grain. It's about 1.4 microns or so in size. The micromagnetic models are shown on the right hand, uh, I'm sorry, on the top uh, row uh, and on the right hand column. And uh, the simulated MF images, MFM images are on the middle row and the experimentally observed MFM images are on the bottom row. And again, I think there's very good agreement between the simulated MFM images from our predicted micromagnetic structures and that, that is observed um, experimentally. Now, uh, at this point, it's worth repeating a, uh, a very nice quote from George Box, who's a famous British statistician, who said in one of his papers that all models are wrong, but, but some are useful. And I think that definitely applies to this study. Not because our models are wrong, but as a reminder that all models are an approximation. And despite what I've just shown you, we are not trying to look at every individual grain to reproduce every aspect of reality. What we are trying to do is to use numerical models to explore complex magnetic structures, to look for general trends and new kinds of magnetic responses. So whilst acknowledging the profound effect of grain shape on magnetic properties, Rather than looking at the very complex shapes that I've just shown you, we are going to simplify our model, and, and primarily what that means, looking at simpler grain shapes, and look at what we might expect the general thermomagnetic behavior of these grains to be, and which we might expect or hope, at least, to be present regardless of the exact grain shape. So one of the basic predictions of a micromagnetic model is the critical grain size for magnetite both the transition from the single domain, uh, the stable single domain grain size to vortex and from vortex to multi-domain. In the results I've shown here, we modeled a magnetic grain structure as we grew a grain from about 30 nanometers diameter to just under three microns and then shrank it back again to 30 nanometers. There is some hysteresis in domain states with grain size, uh, which means that various grain sizes cannot occupy multiple different domain states. But generally, the single domain critical grain size for magnetite is about 80 nanometers for uh, equidimensional grains. 
and it's possible to nucleate a multi-domain grain-like structure with well-defined block walls in a grain perhaps as small as three microns. If we take the lower uh, super paramagnetic to single domain grain size at about 40 nanometers, then uh, the grain size range for single vortex domain structure is about two orders of magnitude greater than that of the single domain. And of course, uh, the single domain grain size range will increase with elongation, uh, but, but then of course the single vortex range will increase also. The clear implication and why I wanted to show you this is that unless your sample has very fine grains or small but highly elongated grains, then your rock sample is going to include many PSD single vortex grains. And I think there is a fair chance that the magnetization of many paleomagnetic samples will be dominated by these single vortex domain states. So that said, we are going to try and build the single vortex model of thermomagnetic remnants from our micromagnetic models. But before we do that, let's remind ourselves of the assumptions of paleomagnetic recording. What we assume when a rock cools is that uh, each grain has a magnetic stability or relaxation time tau, which rapidly increases as the temperature cools. In fact, this relaxation time can be of the order of nanoseconds uh, near the cube temperature. And of course, by the time you get to room temperature, it can be many of orders of magnitude greater than the age of the solar system. As the temperature decreases and the relaxation time of the, of the grain approaches the observation time, we call that temperature the blocking temperature. One of the fundamental laws of paleomagnetic observation is that for a grain that becomes blocked at Tb on cooling, then on heating, it must become unblocked at that same temperature. This is the principle of reciprocity and it's fundamental to paleomagnetism because it implies that we can replace the magnetization lost at any temperature interval in uh, any temperature interval as we heat up the sample with a laboratory induced magnetization in the same temperature interval as we cool down and that the ratio of the NRM loss to the PTRM gained is proportional then to the HM field. Fortunately, of course, this is exactly what single domain theory predicts. And uh, single domain theory is shown very briefly here. It's fairly straightforward, uh, but it's worth going through uh, even briefly since it in fact is very similar to how we will construct our pseudo single domain model of thermomagnetic remnants. Nayel's single domain TRM theory assumes that we have uh, a uniaxial single domain grain shown here, so that there are only two stable domain uh, directions of magnetization, state one and state two, either uh, in, in, along the long axis in one direction or the other. We can calculate the energy barrier between these two states, and these energy barriers are shown here as delta E2 to one and delta E1 to two, depending on whether the state goes from one to two or from two to one. Uh, as uh, from these energy barriers, then we can determine the switching frequency using Arrhenius system activation equation, uh, shown here as K1 to two and K2 to one, that describes the rate at which a domain state changes from state one to two or from state two to one. We can use these uh, rate functions to follow the evolution of the domain states as a function of time, uh, temperature and applied field in this rate equation here. And uh, we can then use that to determine the magnetization for any temperature or time or applied field. So from this very simple, um, set of equations, we can uh, simulate a cooling in a field and so calculate its thermomagnetic remnants. This single domain theory though makes some very harsh assumptions. So we assume that all grains are uniformly magnetized, that they're uniaxial, only two possible domain states. Each domain state has an equal and opposite magnetization and the energy barriers uh, assume coherent rotation. Of course, none of those are satisfied by single vortex grains. The predictions it makes, of course, are that the, the TRM is linearly proportional to the external field, thank goodness. 
that the TRM can be reconstructed from uh, adding a number of partial thermal ramifications. That's the law of additivity. And that the uh, single main grains block and unblock at the same temperature. So this is the law of reciprocity. Whilst we generally find, of course, that the total TRM is indeed linearly proportional to the field strength in which it's magnetized, many samples, actually probably most, do not satisfy the requirement of reciprocity of blocking temperatures. So that is illustrated here uh, quite clearly. This is from um, data from a 2001 paper of Dunlop on Özdemir, where they took uh, magnetite samples of uh, known grain sizes and gave them a partial thermal remnant magnetization between uh, 350, uh, 370 and 350, and then subjected that partial thermal remnants to a stepwise thermal demagnetization. And what they found was that between 50 and 90% of the remnants unblocks either below or above that blocking temperature of the PTRM. None of the samples that they show here actually obey that reciprocity law. Even the smallest grains, the uh, 600 nanometers or 1,000 nanometer grains, actually obey that uh, reciprocity law. So in uh, pin intensity experiments, this effect would result in a curvature of the data and the array plots shown here on the right-hand side, with actually no indication of whether the average gradient gives an under or overestimate of the ancient field. So uh, most explanations of these effects normally call upon multi-domain behavior, where we impose a phenomenological distribution of blocking temperatures, such as the very nice work of Carl Fabian in his 2000 uh, JGI paper. But although the figures here demonstrate that reciprocity failure uh, increases with green size, it's still very noticeable that in the smallest green sizes, which are clearly in the pseudo single domain green size range, also fail this reciprocity. So what I want to do in the rest of this talk, uh, I'm way behind already, is to try and build a model of pseudo single domain uh, TRMs and explore what, to what extent this can account for the reciprocity failure that is exhibited here and to speculate what this might then mean for our ability to determine the ancient geomagnetic field intensity. So as in the single domain TRM model, to construct our pseudo single domain thermomagnetic model, we need to find the available domain states and calculate the energy barriers between these states. Small PSD grains are generally in a single domain, uh, sorry, a single vortex state as shown here. These vortex states carry their remnants in the vortex cores generally, and they generally align with the easy anisotropy axes either crystalline or shape. We calculate the energy barriers between the different domain states by a technique called the nudged elastic band method that attempts to find the minimum energy path between these two states. We can do this for uh, all grains of all sizes, for all temperatures, and then use the energy barriers to determine the relaxation time, again, from the Arrhenius equation um, as a function of temperature, uh, as, uh, as, as indicated here. Exactly the same as we did in the single domain theory, we define the blocking temperature where this relaxation time is equal to the observation time. And I've stated it here arbitrarily as being 60 seconds. So we did this in our 2017 paper versus Nagy and um, Lisa Talks. And this is what we found. We found that, in fact, single vortex grains were generally very stable, more than capable of carrying large thermomagnetic remnants of the time scales of many billions of years. We also saw that there was an unstable zone uh, at the transition from the single domain grain size range to the vortex uh, grain size range, and that as the grain uh, grows out of that unstable zone, there is a range of grain sizes where both the uh, hard aligned vortices and the easy aligned vortices can coexist. So we speculate here, and what I'm going to use in, in our model is that such grains might have a more complex thermomagnetic response 
And uh, we're going to use an example of such a grain to see what that might mean in terms of a PST TRM model, kind of a worst case scenario, if you like. So uh, this is the grain that we're going to concentrate on for the rest of this uh, talk. It's a 100 nanometer cube octahedral grain, 30% elongated along the 100 direction. Uh, and it has, a, uh, it has several blocking temperatures, but uh, the major blocking temperature is about 200 degrees centigrade or so. Uh, so it can nucleate a stable vortex domain structure along the 100 or minus 100 direction. That's along the long axis of the grain. And there are four other stable vortex states uh, along the short axis. And there are four symmetrical short axes as shown here, the 011. Uh, well, you can read them, I'm not going to read them out. And the LEM energies of each of these domain states are pretty much identical for all temperatures. So here's uh, uh, the energies as a function of temperature. Of course, you know, people say, well, of course, this is dominated by MS and you should normalize it by MS, which I've tried, it doesn't really help very much. Um, so uh, they're almost equal, you can see, a change, in fact, for, uh, for the lowest energy domain state that transits from the um, short axis, the short axis at room temperatures, the lowest energy domain state, and the long axis is slightly higher. This changes at a temperature of about 160 degrees, uh, where for a long period afterwards, the uh, long axis is the lowest energy state and the short axis is the, is the high energy state. So we are going to construct a thermal activation model for single vortex grains. And we, in order to do that, we need to calculate the relaxation frequencies uh, given by this equation between every available domain state and in an applied field H. This means we need to calculate the energy barriers between each short axis and every other short axis, uh, short aligned states, and between each long axis aligned state and every other short axis state. All these possible transitions are shown here in this uh, central figure. But as we will see on the next slide, these are in fact just a combination of a very few different types of domain transitions. From the uh, relaxation times, we build a complete uh, matrix here of relaxation frequencies between all the different domain states here labeled this Q matrix. And from this, we can determine the relative population of the different domain states at a particular temperature and time using the uh, matrix exponential in a method outlined by Fabian and Shishirbikov in their JGI 218 paper. We can then evolve this system through an iterative process where the population of different domain states at a time t plus delta t is simply given by the population of the, of the domain states at a time t multiplied by the matrix of uh, transition probabilities. Since the time and field can change with, uh, sorry, since the temperature and field can change with time, it can evolve the system through any arbitrary se sequence of thermal history. And in particular, we can simulate the acquisition of an NRM plus its subsequent thermal cycling through a multi-step teleotype pillow intensity experiment. And so we're now gonna look at some of those results. So the uh, matrix of transition frequencies we saw on the previous slide, as I said, was made up of a number of different symmetrical domain transitions that can be one of three types. We can have transitions between a, um, a short axis and a long axis or a short axis and another short axis or a long axis and a short axis. Every other domain state that you see in this grain can be achieved through a hop between one of those different types of transitions. So the uh, short aligned axis, uh, the short aligned vortex to the long aligned vortex transition curve is given by this red line. The long aligned um, vortex to the short aligned vortex transition is given by the blue line and the short line vortex to this nearest other short line vortex is given by this green line. 
So there are three transitions uh, that are possible in this particular grain. The other thing that's important to realize at this point is that the domain states have uh, different net magnetizations. Oh. So that the magnetization along, let me go back once here, I missed one. Uh, the magnetization, these are the magnetizations as a function of temperature for each of the, uh, for the long and the short axis aligned vortex state. And you can see, uh, well, this is negative here, but you can see that the long aligned vortex state has a much larger magnetization than the short. And basically the remnants is carried by the core. The vortex core is longer in the long axis than it is in the short. And so it yields a, a higher net magnetic remnants by about 44%. So this relaxation phase diagram is very important because it actually um, defines the complete thermomagnetic behavior of the grain. And so it's worth looking at in some detail. Uh, in the yellow region here, uh, for temperatures above about uh, 240 uh, centigrade, the only stable state uh, on normal time scales is the vortex state aligned along the long or axis. So the stability of the state uh, is given by the uh, height above a, any particular relaxation time. So if we take grains that are stable on timescales of longer than one minute, we can see uh, that um, nothing is stable above about 500 degrees, but then the long aligned axis becomes stable. Uh, so anything that gets into the long axis, uh, there's an energy barrier between that and the short axis. Uh, at the other extreme, at lower temperatures up to about 130 degrees centigrade, this green shaded region, all the main states are stable. And in fact, the energy barriers in all these states are so high that it's going to be almost impossible to change from one state to the other. This blue shaded region is the critical zone. And uh, this is where the rate at which the sample is cooled through this zone dramatically affects the room temperature distribution of the blocked domain states. Uh, okay, I'm way over time already, so I'll try and speed up. So we take two particular examples here, fast and slow cooling. So uh, this is an example of fast cooling uh, shown by this dotted line here. And virtually all domain states, sorry, uh, the first domain state to be blocked as we, as we cool from high temperatures is the long aligned domain states. And by the time any other domain state becomes possible, this energy barrier is too high. So we re reach room temperature, everything is aligned along the long axis. Uh, we can take another example of fast cooling, uh, uh, sorry, slow cooling shown by this uh, relaxation time of a million years, so a very extreme case. And as we see here, as we cool down, the first domain state to become stable is the barrier between the short and the long. So everything likes to be aligned along the short axis. And as you cool it further, well, in fact, the, the long axis here never becomes stable. So in very slow, slowly cooled samples, everything's gonna be aligned along the short axis. In very fast cooled samples, everything will be aligned along the long axis. So this is completely counterintuitive and opposite to the cooling rate correction, I guess we, we, common, we think of in single domain grains. And of course, this is just one grain. I'm not suggesting this is true for all pseudo single domain grains or even all pseudo vortex domain states, but it's a clear demonstration that even in this rather common grain morphology, these unexpected magnetic effects can happen and it might well be common enough to account for the observed PTRM tails and curvature and the observed the Y plots. It's also uh, illustrative of this uh, previously undocumented effect in PSD grains of uh, a temperature and thermal history dependence of magnetic domain structure that controls the preferred alignment of domain states. The next step is to, continue ran to consider a random distribution of such particles and simulate the thermal cycling in a Talia multi-step type paleo intensity experiment uh, that involves cooling from above the Curie parent to generate an NRM. And I will show you 
a couple of examples at different cooling rates, and then thermal cycling in a, in a multi-step tele experiment, uh, which we use a laboratory cooling rate of 40 minutes per temperature step. Uh, one of the first things to check, of course, is that our NRM is linearly proportional to the applied field. So that's what I showed here on the uh, left-hand side. On the right-hand side here is the sequence of temperature and fields as a function of time in our simulated multi-step Telia experiment. This is just one protocol. Actually, the simulations I'll show you will have PTRM uh, uh, checks in it and PTRM tail checks in it as well. So here's the first simulated array plot. It's for a slowly cooled NRM over 600 million uh, seconds. So that's about 18 years. And uh, as I already said, the laboratory cooling rate of 40 minutes. This slow cooling has resulted in domain states predominantly aligned on the short grain axis and the fast laboratory remagnetization realigns the magnetization to the long axis. So the large difference in the remagnetization occupancy of states results in this very large PTRM check failures shown by these uh, red triangles here. And of course, these PTRM failures are intrinsic to the domain structure, of course, and nothing to do with chemical alteration. And although not often done, the PTRM tail check shown here by this uh, green uh, rectangle is also very large. And this is an indication of the failure of the reciprocity of the blocking temperatures. Uh, if we look at a cooling rate much closer to the laboratory rate, this one is cooled over 6,000 seconds. So that's about, uh, about 1.7 hours. We see that uh, the sample now passes the PTRM check from these red triangles, but still fails the PTRM tail check. And the blocking temperature reciprocity failure indicated by that tail check at 175 uh, degrees centigrade then contributes to the curvature of the Orion plot. Uh, so one thing I would like to explain if I just have a few more minutes is um, the uh, both the array plots exhibit high temperature PTRM hooks shown by this green region caused by a peak in the PTRM gained between two and 300 degrees centigrade and a decrease at high temperatures uh, subsequently shown by this uh, yellow region, the magnetization plot. And this can be explained by examining our relaxation phase diagram as we put in uh, PTRMs at increasing temperatures, we first activate the um, grains that are aligned along the short axis as we, as we heat up from uh, below. The first grains that we reactivate that become unstable are the short aligned um, grains. And uh, then these grains will transit to long aligned axes, which have larger remnants, And so we get an increase in the PTRM peak at, uh, at around two to 300. Once we get into regions where the long axis grains can be reactivated, then some of those long axis grains will uh, switch to short axes. And then we get this decrease of the PTRM at larger PTRM temperatures. Uh, so uh, in this instance, then th this uh, difference in blocking temperature from heating from below or cooling from above um, explains the reciprocity failure. Uh, and um, this um, decrease in, as I said, decrease in the PTRM for increasing temperatures then uh, explains this um, hook that we see at high temperatures. So these features of high temperature hooks and peaks in the high temperature PTRMs are, are not so unusual. Uh, and I've got one example here uh, from a sample of a lava from uh, Ohio, uh, basaltic lava from uh, Hawaii, that shows the same high temperature PTRM hook. Of course, this is just one example. Uh, there may be many explorations for such magnetic behavior, but it's likely that these fine grain basalts actually do contain PSD grains, and at least it is consistent with the uh, uh, observations and predictions that we make. 
All right, so I've made, uh, I've covered a lot of ground, uh, gone way over time, uh, which I apologize for. I'm just gonna summarize the results in four short slides. So we've built a um, thermomagnetic model for PSD grains that accounts for any thermomagnetic history. It predicts this failure of reciprocity so that the blocking and unblocking temperatures are quite different. That results in PTRM check failures, can result in PTRM tails. Uh, it arises when different domain states with similar energy barriers are possible in uh, one particular grain. Uh, this is unlike multi-domain grains, though, because the domain states have high remnants. The number of domain states are fewer and behave in a more predictable way. The very large PTRM failure and PTRM tails in our example are the result of large differences in the remnants of the different allowed domain states and the fact that the energy barriers between the different domain states change as, uh, at, at different rates as a function of temperature. The extreme reciprocity failure shown in our example um, is, uh, sorry, the, the extreme reciprocity failure shown in our example are seen in single vortex grains that have multiplicity of different domain states, I think, that I've already said, which may be predictable. And you might argue that, that actually the number of grains that have this multiplicity of domain states is actually very narrow and larger grains are going to be slightly better behaved, maybe predominantly um, vortices aligned with the easy axis. However, in real grains, of course, you have lots of highly irregular grain shapes, as I showed at the beginning of the talk, with multiple grain axes that might, in fact, then promote the existence of multiple LEM states, even in these small grains, and so might have benefit from the same effects that we've shown in uh, this example today. So we know that uh, these combined effects, whatever the grain size range and whatever grain shapes are affected by uh, the things that I've shown today, these cannot be so big that they completely destroy paleomagnetism because we know we can extract paleo intensities uh, sometimes. And um, the exciting advance that we've shown today is that actually we can now simulate TRMs in single vortex grains. We do still need to map out the relaxation phase diagrams for different grain sizes and shapes, and to look at how big an effect this might be, which grains are poor recorders, and how maybe we can detect them. And finally, we hope, uh, Les and I hope together that we're going to build a compact and easily run simulation tool for mixtures of single domain and PSD grains to explore these types of paleomagnetic recording characteristics. Okay, that was only roughly twice the time, I think. So. Well, thanks very much, <laughs> Wendy. You're only a five minutes over, so I think we can uh, I'll give Wen a, a, a round of, of virtual applause for a, a really interesting talk with a lot of uh, a lot of profound implications, I think, for how we understand um, paleomagnetism and, and, and paleomagnetic recorders. So um, I can open the floor to, to, to questions, so you please feel free to raise your hand. Uh, so I can see Stuart Gilder is straight in there. And you go, Stuart. So thanks for that. But I, I have a question. I don't understand why cooling rate is going to influence which access gets gets magnetized or or why it's going to yeah why that would influence but but my more my my really important question there is i would imagine that which axis gets magnetized depends on field strength so does it depend on field strength well, yeah it of course it does the field strength uh the field strength produces a bias, but you know, we had a random assembly of such grains. So uh, the component of the field uh, might equally be uh, aligned along some short axes or long axes. So the field produces a bias to alignment of the domain states, whether they're along the short or the, the long. So that doesn't, uh, you know, if we, had, if we had every grain was aligned to the particular anisotropy, and all the grains were aligned uh, in terms of their shape, then that might be the effect. But we have these are random, completely random distributions. 
so, um, uh, and in fact, I mean, I, I haven't shown, you know, I tried to squeeze in as much as I could today. You can look at the Zydefeld plots and they, they, they perfectly well record paleo, in, uh, paleomagnetic directions. Uh, so um, there's, there's no fabric, if you like, in these. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, the uh, cooling rate, um, so your question was that the ability of cooling rate to change the preference of the alignment of the grains. Uh, I obviously didn't explain that well enough. I rushed too much. Uh, I, I can go through it very quickly again, uh, possibly if I can get back. Oh. Go back from slide 160 to, okay, let's take the first one here. So the, 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 the cooling rate dependence uh, really is embedded in this phase diagram of the main states because it depends upon, um, as you cool down, which, um, which type of the main state nucleates first and becomes stable first, you know, so, at very high temperatures, you can see all these relaxation times are very, very small. So below about 500, everything is really tiny and um, everything is unstable as we, as we might expect. And at fast cooling rates, so we could imagine that each of these temperatures are only, uh, only sits at each of these temperatures for one minute. I mean, it, obviously in our, um, in our simulations of NRM, we have a Newtonian cooling rate, but just as a very broad approximation here. Uh, if we imagine each of these temperatures that sits at for one minute, then we might, we might get the domain states that uh, are indicated where this relaxation time creates uh, energy barrier with the domain states. So as you cool down, um, the, the first energy barrier for fast cooling, I'm calling one minute at each temperature fast cooling. The first domain state energy barrier is defined by the transition from the long to the short. So any grains that end up being the long, aligned along the long axis can't easily move to the short axis. And by the time that um, the short axis remain, is available, so is stable, if you like, so that's below about 200 degrees. So here we find a short or long energy barrier. So these are now stable, the short axis is now stable, but the problem is that everything's already locked in the long axis. So, so that's what happens at fast cooling rates, at very long cooling rates, then everything is essentially uh, unstable or on the million year time scale until you get down to uh, whatever this is, 140 or 130 degrees. And the first energy barrier that it can, uh, that it comes across, the first thing that becomes stable are these short aligned grains. So uh, anything that finds itself in a sh short aligned axis can't easily move out into anything else. And the long line actually doesn't become stable until about room temperature. So uh, that's an extreme example. I mean, not many things will cool at time scales of millions of years, but it's an extreme example, but this, the exact uh, position of these different relaxation curves essentially defines how the proportion of the proportion of the domain states are distributed among the different available domain states, depending on how quickly they move through this uh, uh, decision point, if you like, uh, of the different uh, domain state frequencies. Did that make any sense to you, Stu? Yeah, and so those curves are made with large numbers of grains that are randomly oriented. Is that uh, right? These domain, these energy barriers refer to just one orientation. So uh, these are the these are the different allowed domain states. Yeah. So this this doesn't have any field um, energy. Th 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 these energy barriers uh, assume no external field. We add that into the model uh, in this other part here. So that was just the three different types of transitions we can have, short to long, long to short, short to short, in terms of the orientation of the domains with respect to the grain axes. 
Uh, and then, uh, so that's, um, and the different types of transitions are shown here. So this is, uh, this is one particular short axis. So there are four different short axes and two different long axes. And you can look at all the different transitions of every grain with every one. You don't have anti-parallel transitions because they always go over a different, different uh, domain state. But all of these combination of different transitions are incorporated in this um, relaxation frequency matrix. Okay. And that includes a bias to the field, which is a vector. When we look at our distri random distribution of grains, of course, uh, then we in each orientation of that grain, we'll see it essentially a different direction of the magnetic field relative to the grain axes. Okay. It's, the algebra is a bit messy, but- uh, the, that, That's the part I missed. Yeah, yeah. thank you, yeah. Thanks very much. So, uh, Brendan has his hand up as well for a question. Hi. Hi, Brendan. Um, yeah, uh, I had a question. What size is the grain that you're showing here with the RI plot? So, the grain, this one, uh, these RI plots are for a mono dispersion. So, they are um, 100 nanometers. Uh, we use this 100 nanometers ESVD. Uh, we always like to quote things in terms of SVDs, which is the equivalent spherical volume diameter. Anyway, it's 100 nanometers. 30% elongated along the um, 100 axes. And um, it was chosen because it was just on the boundary as you emerge from this unstable zone that we predict uh, from, this, uh, from our 2017 paper. We chose it uh, because we didn't know actually uh, how it was going to behave thermomagnetically. And we wanted to look for something that was likely to have a large effect. Uh, in the end, it's had a very large effect, much more than we probably uh, would have liked. But um, the, the principle here is that we have a grain that has, a that has different domain states of similar energies in it. I think that's the principle. So this effect, although we've, we've chosen it uh, because we knew it was going to have two different domain states that were stable in it. I think it, this, the effects that we see should be replicated in any grain that has different domain states of similar energies in it. If you have a dominant, if you have a, a, a minimum energy state that is uh, much lower than other possible domain states throughout its temperature range, then you won't see these effects. So the question is, how frequent are these types of domain of grains? And uh, as I said, we, we, people have got pain intensities, including you, that we think are reasonably good. And, but you know, we all know that it's not unusual to have pain intensity failure rates in high percentages. Many of those are chemical alteration. Sometimes chemical alteration is indicated by these PTRM failures. We can sh we've shown here that PTRM failures don't have to be because of chemical alteration. Uh, but um, the extent to which this can account for uh, the curvature, for instance, in uh, the Uriah plots is something that we hope to determine over the next few years. Yeah, have you tried uh, this at any other sizes yet? Or just got we uh, we want to publish this because I'm terrible at publishing. I can see everybody smiling when I say that. Okay, but we're going to publish this soon, and then we're going to move on to the other domain states. Now we, you know, these. What I'm really uh, pleased with is these um, these uh, energy barriers as a function of temperature. These are not polynomial fits. These are actually individual points of the energy barriers that we've calculated. Uh, you know, to calculate, uh, so, so we parameterize these in terms of polynomials that makes our um, simulations of, of uh, simulations of thermomagnetic histories much quicker and easier to do. And what we'd like to do is to just, uh, is to parameterize a whole bunch of these things, which is pretty much donkey work, but it needs to be done. Uh, over the next few months, and then produce this nice tool where we can have a simulation of mixtures of single domain and PSD grains. 
non-interactive, of course. Thank you very much, Brendan. Um, we've got time for one quick more question. Before we, there we go. There's the inevitable question from Rich Harrison. <laughs> Hi, Rich. Hi, Ben. Yeah, this is great, Win. Um, yeah, so, I mean, how this is going to develop is, I mean, ultimately what we'd like to be able to do is, is once you've done all that, that sort of, what, what did you call it, donkey work? Or yeah, grunt work. Database, is to be able to map what you find in the, what you showed at the beginning, which is the sort of slice and view models, right? Where you have, mm -hmm. you, you have your particle size distribution and you know uh, that in great detail to be able to map that onto to this model and then, and then do the calculation to compare it to, to, to an yeah. actual real sample. So, so how, how far away from that? That dream, are, are we? <laughs> I, I think we are, well, um, you're a potential reviewer, Richard. So uh, if we get the grant proposal, it'll take about 12 months after that. It's, a, it's one of these new fancy new proposals. Um, but uh, I, I estimate uh, to, to get a whole bunch of these done. We have a, we have a workflow now, which, is, which produces these incredibly nice, uh, it's a bit noisy at high temperatures, but a very smooth, um, uh, energy barriers as a function of temperature. We have a workflow that allows us to do that pretty easily. Uh, so we're hoping to get to get this done within uh, twelve months. That's a yeah. That's what we're hoping. And I guess you we're, have to we're close combine think, that with like a, a really broad range of particle sizes and shapes as possible. To make so we would. Happens. The aim is to do uh, to to do grain sizes for. Well, from, from the sort of paramagnetic grain size up to about, probably our limit is gonna be about uh, 200 or, two, or say 250 nanometers and elongations from equidimensional up to maybe 500% elongation. Okay, cool. So that's our hope. In fact, all the numerical, all the micromagnetic models themselves have been done. Uh, we just need to do the ground to process them. So, yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Thank you very much for the, the questions. Um, I think we'll, we'll uh, draw today's uh, seminar to a close, but I wanted to ask everybody to give uh, Wynn another uh, round of applause for, for a really good talk. Thank you very much, Wynn. Thank you. Uh, and I will just hijack uh, the screen share. So, um, there we go. So I, I've updated your title. I've got it correct this time. When um, I noticed you kind of avoided that question of actually how well can we uh, know the ancient geomagnetic field? Maybe in the next magnet seminar, uh, with the answer to that question is numbers. it's going to be very well in a year's time. <laughs> um, so just before uh, we, we bring it all to a complete end, um, just a reminder that um, we're going to have a short break for uh, EGU, and then we'll come back. Um, in in uh, mid June, um, but we're moving to uh, an EU Eastern Hemisphere uh, time slot. So our pre our seminars will be in the mornings in, in in Europe, and they'll be sort of late afternoons into the evenings uh, in in the Eastern Hemisphere, depending upon where you are. Um, and so uh, there'll be more announcements about the exact timing of that. And so we've got a couple of speakers lined up already, uh, and we have some more uh, in 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 plans. But as always, we're looking for um, more speakers um, for our seminar. So if anybody is interested in, in giving a magnet seminar, uh, please just um, let us know. Um, and all of our seminars, including the recording for uh, uh, Wynn's talk today, will be made available on our YouTube channel. Um, and so thank you, everybody, for uh, joining Magnets. And we'll see you uh, next month. Thank you very much. <laughs>